We have breaking news from the nation's capital. The Liberals and NDP have struck a tentative deal that could keep the minority Liberals in power until 2025. Good evening, I'm Ian Hanna-Mansing. Also tonight, escaping a city under siege. We were sitting just under the shelling and we didn't know what, what was happening. It was really terrible. Harrowing tales of escape. Why Russia is blowing Mariupol apart. No word of survivors after a passenger plane fell out of the sky. What brought down a 737 in China? And this could be the most devastating thing that we've seen. The government under pressure to act as the strained supply chain takes on a railway work stoppage. Plus, facing Republican rumblings, Will and Cade go on a charm offensive in the Caribbean. But not everyone's rolling out the welcome wagon. This is The National. All right, let's begin with that breaking news from Ottawa. CBC News has learned the Liberal government and the NDP are in talks to strike a historic deal that would keep the Liberal minority government in power for three more years. That means we would not have a federal election until 2025. The host of Power and Politics on CBC News Network, Vashi Capellos, is here to break this news for us. And Vashi, take us through what you're learning tonight. Hi, Ian. Yeah, the Liberals and the NDP have reached this tentative agreement to, as you put it, keep the Liberals in power at the seat of government until 2025. It would involve the NDP supporting uh, confidence, m motions of confidence or bills of confidence. So, for example, more specifically, the budget for the next four budget cycles. So quite a long period of time. The big thing to note with all of this, though, is that it, it, it is predicated on the support of the NDP. So NDP caucus has to endorse it before the agreement becomes formalized. But right now, there is that tentative deal between the NDP and the Liberals to keep the Liberals in power until 2025. So stability for the Liberals who are in a minority position. But take us through what is likely in this for the, the two parties. Well, very much exactly what you say, stability, the idea that there doesn't need to be an election right away. For the NDP, this is about a, num a number, you know, a couple key policy wins for them. So first, dental care, something that they had pitched in the last election, more comprehensive dental care, you know, under a certain income threshold for seniors, people with disabilities, and then pharmacare as well. I'm told that the prime minister in briefing Liberal caucus this evening talked about those two items and that there would be, uh, you know, some give to the NDP on them. And so the NDP can go and say, hey, these are some big policy wins we got with this agreement. And for those who follow politics closely, they may be wondering if this is a formal coalition, but it is not. It is not. A coalition would have the NDP be in cabinet as well. Uh, it would be a much more formalized agreement. That said, the opposition is already talking about this and characterizing it as a coalition. I'll read you a quick tweet from interim leader Candace Bergen, who just put out a liberal NDP coalition, retweeting our colleague David Cochran's story about this. I'll have much more to say, Bergen says, but right now all I can think is God help us all. That's how the Conservatives are characterizing this tentative and historic agreement tonight. Well, there'll be a lot more reaction to this story that you've broken for us tonight, Vashi. Thank you very much. Let's turn now to the war in Ukraine and the besieged city of Mariupol. With each day, the images coming out grow more disturbing. Under relentless attack for three weeks now, mass graves and near total destruction tell the story. The city nearly completely cut off, making it difficult to get a clear picture of what's happening. By some estimates, as many as 300,000 people are trapped in desperate need of food, water, and medicine. Tonight, we'll look at the strategy driving Russia's brutal onslaught and hear from some who have managed to escape. They'll tell us about the terrifying tragedy they have lived through. Susan Orbison begins our coverage in Lviv tonight. She speaks to a woman who recently fled Mariupol about the ordeal she's been through and the terrible image she can't get out of her mind. <laughs> Tatiana Bulkina had her first good sleep in a month in this Lviv shelter, on the floor but warm and safe. She escaped her bombed and blackened city, Mariupol, on Friday after three harrowing weeks trapped in her basement, nearly out of water and food. But she did get out, still tormented by the siege. 
a horrible hell. While I was going out to find water, I saw a young man, his face burned out, leaving only his skull and his eyes. Anna, do you still see those images, even though you're safe here? It's impossible to forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you worried about those you left behind? I'm worried about everyone. I left my husband, my son, and I'm afraid they could die. Russian troops are everywhere in the city, Tatiana confirms. Soldiers' bodies lying in the streets, no one has buried them. Russia demanded Mariupol surrender by dawn Monday. That was rejected flat out by Ukraine's leaders. They can destroy the whole country and uh, kill all uh, citizens, uh, all population. That's the, uh, the way to, uh, to win. We never give up. But Russia's intent on squeezing the strategic port city, most humanitarian aid can't get in and getting out is dangerous. Ukraine accused Russia of shelling buses of evacuees again Monday, sending three children to hospital. Tatiana had 10 minutes to leave her home. She took her ID and a coat, said goodbyes to her family, and drove out with a local priest. With internet and cellular service cut, she hasn't heard from them since. And Tatiana, what do you think about the Russians who did this to your city? Idiot, idiot. Idiots. They didn't spare people, children, not buildings, nothing. They don't have any humanity. She had to leave her cat behind, too. A surrogate here at the shelter is a rare comfort. Mariupol, cut off and suffering, is a crisis. 2,300 people have already died, and that number could be higher, according to local officials. The picture is still clouded by bombardment and fears that the city could fall. Susan Ormston, CBC News, Lviv. Let's take a closer look at Mariupol and why it's been the focal point of such relentless attacks. It's in the southeast of Ukraine, on the Sea of Azov, between Crimea and the Russian-controlled areas of the Donbass region. And for some analysis, let's bring in Walter Dorn, an expert in military strategy with the Royal Military College of Canada. And, and Walter, what is Russia's military strategy in going after Mariupol? Mariupol is such a strategically important city. Uh, it forms uh, the land bridge between the stronghold in eastern Ukraine and Russia and Crimea, where the Russia, Russian Navy has had bases for over two centuries. So this, uh, this city stands uh, to, to link those two together, and when they can create the combination of forces, they'll be much more powerful. And, and what about this strategy of Russia's? Why are they trying to, to create a siege here and just batter the city, including civilian targets? Yeah, the motivations are hard to understand, but it, it could very well be that they're trying to show an example to the rest of Ukraine that if you do resist, then you will suffer this kind of pain and damage, this heart-wrenching scenes that we see out of Mariupol. And I, I hate to use the word win, but do you think the Russians will win, at least in this city? I think they'll overtake the city and there'll be street to street fighting. And eventually they'll get control of it unless there's some, some peace uh, agreement or ceasefire before then. Uh, but right now it looks like uh, Russia has the advantage and, and it's just, uh, just demolishing that very historic and important city. All right, Walter, thank you very much. Julian. Russia has so far failed to gain ground in Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, but at least eight more people have died after a shopping district and residential neighborhood was shelled last night. <laughs> Crews combed through the twisted wreckage this morning, putting out small fires and searching for survivors. Overnight, they were able to pull some people from the site alive. The moment of impact on the shopping mall was caught on a surveillance camera, revealing the magnitude of the explosion. The city's now under another 35-hour curfew. As the devastation grows, so too does the exodus from Ukraine. According to the United Nations, nearly 3.5 million people have now fled. The vast majority, more than 2 million, have gone to Poland. As Salima Shivji reports, in the capital Warsaw, there is so much need, the city is struggling to keep up, and it's calling on Canada for help. 
far from the bombs and the shelling, Yaroslava Shumik is trying to create some kind of normal. But the pain of her abrupt departure from Kyiv is raw. Her three-year-old son keeps asking for his father. And uh, he was crying for the dead. And I knew that um, it will be for a very long time that I will not have an answer when he will see him. Hugs and puzzles are what get them through the days. Oh. And the help of this Polish couple, who opened the doors of their small apartment without a second thought. Having the history like Poland have, knowing a lot about what happened uh, to people at uh, World War II, um, then we, we sympathized immediately and we wanted to help as much uh, as we could. They barely had time to prepare before they were paired with their guests. That's how desperately this capital city is trying to absorb a sudden spike in population, 20 percent in a few short weeks. There's an outpouring of support for Ukraine, but volunteers are stretched thin, and Warsaw is heaving from the strain. At the country's largest stadium, a crush of refugees wait anxiously. A full day outside, only to get a wristband to wait again inside for Polish identity papers to work, access health care and go to school in their temporary landing spot. It's so hard, Tatiana says, wrangling restless children and standing in line. Here at the Canadian Embassy in Warsaw, there's another long line. Weary Ukrainians waiting to give their biometrics, fingerprints and photos to get the OK to go to Canada. I mean, it's ahead of our time. It's slow going. We came and we saw this huge line and a lot of chaos up front where people are trying to cut in because, you know, livelihood is at stake. And it's only the start of a long process to alleviate the weight of so many refugees converging on Poland. Warsaw's mayor has been pleading for more help from countries like Canada. I would simply say as quickly as possible and with minimum uh, red tape. But the weight of the war is harder to erace for a mother running on instinct. I saved my babies. Now I need to make the other step, how to live, what to earn, to find a job. So, As daunting as that may sound, she says that's the easy part. She can control it, unlike the explosions back home. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Warsaw. Now to a story with major implications across this country. The government faces growing pressure to order Canadian Pacific to get rolling again. Just two days into a work stoppage, both sides deny triggering. Karen Paul shows us what happens when more than 3,000 conductors, engineers and other workers are off the job. These parents recently welcomed the seventh generation of their farm family, even as fears are mounting about their future. It's scary because, yeah, it is one more thing, one more stress to add to a, a farmer, um, specifically here in the prairies where we depend very highly on our rail service. Um, we, we need to get our crops to market. So if we can't get that to our customers, that's a big problem for us here in our small little town. Although less than two days old, the CP work stoppage is yet another logistical blow to an already fragile system. Before the labour dispute, CP was moving almost 49,000 rail cars every week. It's the most critical uh, mode of delivery in, in the country. Which means it's a growing concern here amid calls for back-to-work legislation. So what will the government do to immediately address this situation? The Labour Minister acknowledging the timing is terrible. In Canada, supply chains are still reeling from the B.C. floods from COVID-19 and now a Russian invasion of Ukraine. I am here in Calgary. I am urging the parties to reach an agreement. Not everyone is in favour of government intervention. Instead, there should be pressure applied on the employer to return to the negotiating table and to work out a deal with workers. But industry and farm groups are calling on the government to take quick and decisive action to end this dispute. This could be the most devastating thing that we've seen. As he checks on his barley, this farmer is torn. Luckily, we live in a place like Canada where people do have the right to strike and the, the right for workers to stand up for a better living wage, and I support that as well. Negotiations are ongoing with the help of a federal mediator. Neither side is talking about the progress, but there's no doubt they're feeling the pressure too. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. As of today, millions of Canadians are not required to wear masks in indoor public spaces, including stores and restaurants. 
Ontario and Nova Scotia, the latest provinces to ease those rules, though masks are still required in certain places like healthcare settings. Six other provinces and Yukon had already taken that step. Still to come, Quebec, PEI and the other two territories. Katie Nicholson shows us how dropping those rules are, for some, worrying. Breakfast is served, and for the first time in nearly two years, without a mask. Feels good. It feels like uh, talking to the customers, and half the time I kept pulling up, pulling it down, and they couldn't hear me, and I couldn't hear them. It was uh, kind of annoying after, after a while. It's been too long, and it's nice to see everybody's faces again and see people smiling. Their masks are off, but they aren't far away just in case things change. And while some COVID precautions are gone... It was annoying. So I'm glad I can get rid of it. Some will stay a little longer. We are keeping the borders in between the booths because I'm sure there are some people that are leery of it. Among them, some doctors who think this day has come too soon. You know, I think removing masks should have been delayed a little bit longer. I mean, you know, we have just, uh, you know, lifted the restrictions in Ontario. I don't see why there's such a hurry to drop the masks. There's an Omicron surge right now in Europe and in Asia. Several provinces have already dropped their strictest masking rules, and while scientists are seeing upticks of COVID in wastewater in some places, some say it's too early to point to any trends. We do, I think, struggle when masking gets taken away because it's sort of the last line of defense for us. And so it just makes us feel um, increasingly isolated. Catherine Stevenson's son is vulnerable. A simple cold virus can send him to ICU, and her daughter isn't eligible for the shot yet. As most others take a step toward normal, her family took a step back. We have reverted back to curbside service for the most part. Just feel kind of anxious knowing that people, I think, question us, why are you wearing a mask? At this diner, people's choices will be respected. Because, you know, we all want to feel safe, don't we? Because for some, feeling safe is still a long way off. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. So in Ontario, kids don't need to wear masks in school. Deanna Sumanag Johnson gives us a sense of this tentative first day and shows us how some parents feel they have been ignored by decision makers. At schools in Canada's most populous province, masks, the pandemic's most enduring symbol, no longer have to be worn. But for many parents, worries remain. We're definitely a little on edge about all of it, but ultimately we trust the doctors and we left it up to Zoe. We asked her, she's got them in her bag and we'll see how the day goes. Well, we're a little bit anxious. Uh, I mean, uh, I want to see how that, like, how that uh, does, like how people react to it and like uh, the levels of, of like, the COVID infection, if it goes down or not. Those feelings of frustration might be something Canadian parents are used to by now. According to a new survey done by the Angus Reid Institute in partnership with the CBC, two-thirds of parent respondents said that decision makers are not considering children's well-being enough. Well, I think that that rings true to what I've been hearing from parents. This mother of two heads the English Parents Committee Association in Quebec, one of several provinces where mask mandates have already been lifted in schools. She says political leaders have continuously failed kids during the pandemic in more ways than one. Mental health, physical education, and also just, you know, um, taking the masks away so fast after uh, spring break, that was not putting our children in the best position possible. The removal of masks in schools also means there's now a new hurdle for parents to face, navigating the tension between the families who choose to continue to mask their kids and those who don't. Some think that uh, mask mandates are harmful for kids and something they're good for kids. And so when they're being dropped, that's problematic. When they're being retained, that's problematic. Um, it comes down to also the polarization we see on vaccine, all of that. Which is why experts like her urge that as provinces move towards business as usual, extra investments need to be made in children's mental health programs, both in school and outside of it. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Six more people who are on that now infamous Sunwing flight to Mexico have been fined up to $5,000 for breaking COVID rules. Videos of the December charter flight from Montreal to Cancun show partiers unmasked, dancing, vaping. The transport minister says most of the new penalties are for breaking the vaccination rules and one for not wearing a mask. Transport Canada has handed out 
a dozen penalties in total so far. Ontario's Premier Doug Ford is in Washington meeting with officials to try to convince them that Canada is still a reliable trading partner. As Katie Simpson reports, the convoy protests have left a lasting impression. Washington is getting a taste of a new Canadian export. A smaller, less disruptive version of the Freedom Convoy slowed traffic this weekend. Brutal timing for Canadians in D.C. on a mission to get Americans to forget the damage this movement inflicted on trade. I wouldn't call it anger. They, they were concerned. And we're just here to reaffirm that we have a secure border. Ontario's premier met with U.S. officials to assure them the border blockades that cost billions of dollars in trade will never happen again pointing to his proposed legislation that would expand police training and resources to deal with future protests. The federal public safety minister is also meeting with his U.S. counterparts for a cross-border crime summit where the blockades will be discussed. Americans Canadian business leaders say this issue remains a distraction. It's caused all of us who are out there championing Ontario to have to explain it. And if you're having that conversation, you're not having an investment conversation. The push to smooth over the trading relationship comes as the Biden administration aggressively pursues its Buy American agenda. Instead of relying on foreign supply chains, let's make it in America. But the president has failed to get his protectionist policies passed in Congress, including his plan to give huge tax breaks to customers who buy U.S. union-built electric vehicles, which would take jobs out of Canada. The proposal appears dead for now, which is a win for Canada. Thank goodness. I am a strong believer of buy North America. Um, you know, our, our, our trade with the United States is so integrated and, and the supply chain is absolutely critical. Canada can't exactly celebrate. Joe Biden is unpopular and could introduce new Buy American policies before the midterm elections as a way to shore up support. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Investigators in China are trying to figure out why a Boeing passenger jet suddenly fell from the sky. Next, what we know about the moments leading up to the crash. We can't rule out a bomb or some type of an explosion. Plus, as Russia continues to pummel the port city of Mariupol, one man's story of escaping the horror. We were driving and we hear a lot of rockets just flying over us. And as Will and Kate tour the Caribbean and celebrate the Queen, protesters have another idea. There's been a crime against humanity. We're back in two. In southern China, investigators are trying to figure out what caused a passenger jet to plummet to Earth with 132 people on board. The China Eastern flight was en route from Kunming to the industrial center of Guangzhou. As Sasha Petrasik tells us, the jet was at cruising altitude when suddenly it took a steep dive and slammed into the ground near Wuzhou. The crash came as breaking news in China, as a shock to friends and relatives waiting at the airport in Guangzhou. 132 people would not be arriving this afternoon. For a colleague of one passenger, the hard part was calling his mother. She sobbed, he says. She didn't believe her 29-year-old son was gone. The end of China Eastern Flight 5735 seems unbelievable to many. A Boeing 737 cruising at some 29,000 feet in good weather suddenly nosedives, dropping straight to the ground in just over two minutes. Not a word to air traffic control, say Chinese officials. For one driver below with a dash cam, the plane appeared briefly as a vertical streak, plummeting. The wreckage setting the bamboo forest below on fire. Searchers arrived quickly and worked into the night. The Chinese media reported seeing no survivors. The crash surprised experts too, who say this version of the 737 has a good safety record. It's got a, uh quite a track record and a long history. It's, it's just an excellent airplane. Keith McKee is a former pilot. He says crashes like this one are very rare. So something happened suddenly that caused them to lose control of the aircraft. And with the information that we have now, we can't rule out a bomb 
or some type of an explosion. That too would be unusual in China, where air travel has become much safer. Crashes almost unheard of. The last fatal one was reported more than a decade ago. Sasha Petrusik, CBC News, Toronto. In Ukraine, the port city of Mariupol is under siege. Civilians trapped inside, though some have made it to safety. We jumped into the car and we ran out of the city. Next, one man tells us what it was like to escape from a city under threat and under attack. And months after those floods in British Columbia, one couple finally makes their way back home. We have new satellite images tonight from a city under siege. This is Mariupol in eastern Ukraine. Since the invasion, it suffered the worst of the Russian onslaught. According to Ukrainian officials, about 90% of the city has either been damaged or destroyed. Earlier today, I spoke with Artur Shevchenko. Just days ago, he and his family were able to escape a long, difficult drive to western Ukraine. Artur, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Hi, thank you for having me. You were in Mariupol as recently as, as three days ago. And where you were living, was there shelling going on where you were? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like we were in the shelter for like two weeks on the same spot. And I was able to sleep only like five hours per day because Every, mo every morning, started from, starting from the 6, 5 a.m., shelling was started. It was constant shelling. Uh, and it started from the suburbs of the city. And day by day, it, it became, it, it, it uh, was hitting the center of the city, all of the districts. Uh, so it was uh, terrible. Yeah, I, I even got some, uh, like, remains of the missile from, like, maybe one or two meters from my window of my shelter. And you were living there with your, your family, your extended family. What was it like getting food and water? It was impossible to, to get some food because there were no, not, no like zero working shops. Uh, all shops was, were like robbed because of because we ha had no food uh, and we had only like springs natural springs from the some parts of the city just to get some water and and, and d describe for us in a little bit more detail how you were feeling and your family and other people there while all of this was going on what was the mood we were hoping that uh, ukraine will win or some negotiations will start and something, the war will, will, will be stopped. But uh, when we lost our electricity, there were three or four days without any connection to internet. And we were sitting just under the shelling and we didn't know what, what was happening, like who is winning. And it was really terrible. And, and what was it like getting out of the city how, how, how what's that journey like well uh like three three days ago we jumped into the car and we ran out of the city it was that day i remember a lot of cars like thousands of cars i if i'm not mistaken that day maybe three or four thousands of cars left the city at the, the, the morning it was a uh, terrible traffic under the sh shelling it was a sea, seaside of the city, and uh, we were driving, and uh, we hear a lot of rockets just flying over us. And as you got further west, did it get safer, or did you feel in danger the whole time? Well, uh, honestly, I, I, uh, like before this this the interview, like before, uh, I heard some noise from the street, and I was just a little bit worried what's happening here. Yeah, but uh, where I'm now, it's safer, all the safer, but uh, at this moment, Ukraine is not a safe place for, for Ukrainian citizen, and it is really bad. And Arthur, one last question. What's next for you and your family? 
Well, we will stay here, I guess. We will be. We will hope that this war will will end. And uh, I want to say that, like all of our country is really uh, happy and appreciate all of this, uh, all of the efforts of the West. I so appreciate that you've stayed up late to speak with us tonight, and and I wish you and your family safety. Thank you. We have an update tonight on the young Ukrainian girl whose rendition of the Frozen song Let It Go in a bunker in Kyiv made it around the world. At the time, she said it was her dream to perform on a big stage. And last night, that wish came true. Seven-year-old Amelia singing the Ukrainian anthem at a charity concert in Poland. Polish and Ukrainian artists also perform to help raise money for victims of the war. In the weeks since the invasion, fundraisers for Ukraine have gained a lot of momentum, thanks in part to celebrities picking up the cause. Lindsay Duncombe looks at some of the creative efforts to raise funds. Hi, everyone. This is the changing face of celebrity activism. Retired soccer player and megastar David Beckham handed over his Instagram stories to the head of a perinatal hospital in Ukraine. She shows how babies are cared for in the basement between air raid sirens. There's a link to donate to UNICEF. Actor Mila Kunis, who was born in Ukraine, and her husband Ashton Kutcher have launched their own fundraising campaign, raising more than $34 million U.S. Our collective effort will provide a softer landing for so many people as they forge ahead into their future of uncertainty. The couple earned a personal thank you from President Vladimir Zelensky himself. Celebrities becomes the leaders, really drawing the whole world's attention to the message they want to send out. Social media brings people into celebrities' lives, a cultivated intimacy that increases their power to connect and persuade. Take Arnold Schwarzenegger's direct appeal to Russians. The strength and the heart of the Russian people have always inspired me. And that is why I hope that you will let me tell you the truth about the war in Ukraine and what is happening there. The former governor of California shared his own family experience with war and his ties to the country. There are traditional celebrity appeals, too. Singer Camila Cabello is joining Ed Sheeran and others for a fundraising concert broadcast live across Britain. And The Clash gave a Ukrainian punk band permission to rework their song, London Calling, to be a lament for Ukraine's capital and a call to action. In an ever more connected world, these calls have growing reach as celebrities use their star power to help bring relief. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Three women are speaking out in a CBC News investigation, sharing what they say happened after filing formal complaints against the same gynecologist. Their responsibility is to protect the public, not to protect the doctor. It is outrageous. Next, why they say accountability is taking too long. For nearly two years, CBC News has been tracking the case of Dr. David Gerber, the Toronto gynecologist has been accused by multiple women of misconduct, allegations he vigorously denies. Tonight, three of his former patients say the Ontario regulatory body that investigates doctors is dragging its feet, leaving them feeling re-victimized. They spoke to the CBC's Judy Trin. For years, these women have shouldered a burden of secret shame and broken trust. Now they're attempting to seek accountability together. It feels like I'm not alone anymore. Because you're with people who understand what you've been through. Elizabeth Adamu was the first woman to come forward in 2020. But now two others are standing with her. The three women have complained to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. They allege that a gynecologist improperly conducted vaginal procedures that were sometimes painful or unnecessary, and that the doctor didn't obtain proper consent. That physician is Dr. David Gerber, who has been practicing for almost 30 years. This isn't an issue of technique. 
This is a sexual violation that I'm alleging occurred to me. And I'm doing this as my civic duty to warn other women that there is no protection available to us. And the protection that does say that it's there, it's not functioning, it's broken. It's taken Candace Jones more than five years to speak publicly about her experience. I suffer from PTSD. Um, I experience insomnia and nightmares, um, dissociation. There are times when I, ha I can't drive because my mind is so distracted. Through his lawyer, Dr. David Gerber says the examination techniques were routine and properly conducted. He accuses the women of coordinating to destroy his reputation. Allegations are ultimately always vigorously prosecuted. The CPSO, the body that oversees doctors in Ontario, has been investigating the complaints against Gerber for nearly two years. It has increased inspections of his clinic, but will not comment on his specific case. But the college does say it will act according to the evidence it finds. The allegations that are ultimately sent to the discipline committee, if there is a referral, are the allegations that the screening committee determines are most appropriate and can be established. During its investigation, the CPSO warned these women not to speak to each other, a routine practice the women find insulting. For the insinuation that women coming together to go to the police or go to the CPSO to get them to pay attention is being misconstrued as corroborating. It's outlandish. After leaving her in the dark for months, the college then gave Jones just seven days to turn over all emails and texts about Gerber or risk being charged with contempt of court. The isolation that is expected of us from the CPSO, that we cannot communicate with each other. We are not supposed to provide support it's to one another. for the integrity of the, the process. Exactly, for the integrity of the process. It's you hear a lot. It is crucial to our survival in, in getting through this. The women also want their claims investigated as sexual boundary violations. Under the CPSO's own policy, Doctors should explain the scope of procedures and obtain consent before examination. Instead, the CPSO is pursuing their allegations as instances of dishonorable conduct. A doctor committing dishonorable conduct could be a doctor that swears at you. I mean, how, how far, how dummy down do you get? All of us are patients, therefore all of us are at risk. Senator Mary Lou McFedrin won't comment on the Gerber case, but sees a troubling pattern with the CPSO. Of the sexual boundary complaints that she has reviewed over three decades, McFedrin says more than half are investigated as lesser infractions. They'll find a way to not say the word sexual. And the moment you see that, you see that a path is being created that is a, a path to lesser consequences, lesser degree of responsibility, and less respect for what patients are reporting. Gerber says nurses were present for each encounter and they never observed him acting in a physically or sexually abusive manner. In the meantime, more women have come forward. There are now at least 11 patients who have filed misconduct complaints against Dr. David Gerber. Their responsibility is to protect the public, not to protect the doctor. It is outrageous. Just a few days ago, Jones learned the complaint she filed more than a year ago was dismissed. But the CPSO did say it would advise Gerber to ensure thorough patient consent and adequately prepare patients for the potential level of pain. As for the other two women, they're wondering how much longer they will have to wait to be heard. The college has yet to set a hearing date. Judy Trin, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge in the Caribbean. Why the royal tour could be about a lot more than the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The U.S. Senate heard today for the first time from Joe Biden's nominee, who would become the first black woman on the Supreme Court. Thank you. 
for this historic chance to inspire future generations and to ensure liberty and justice for all. If confirmed by the Senate, 51-year-old Judge Katanji Brown Jackson will replace Liberal Justice Stephen Breyer. Jackson will face questions from senators tomorrow and Wednesday. A simple majority vote is needed for her confirmation. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are on a Caribbean tour, officially to mark a major milestone for the Queen. But as Ellen Morrow reports, many see this as a promotional tour to keep the monarchy alive in the Caribbean. The moments royal tours are made of. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge dancing with locals in Belize. A visit officially to mark the Queen's 70 years on the throne. Also being dubbed a charm offensive. An attempt to sway Caribbean nations to hang on to the monarchy. The tour comes just four months after another milestone. Barbados removing the Queen as head of state a decision born of Britain's brutal colonial legacy of slavery. They've sent the beautiful couple out there to, to woo those Caribbean nations that still have the Queen as the head of state. This professor says Barbados's path is an important one. What has the, the, the British Empire offered the English-speaking Caribbean? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a traumatic and brutal legacy. The royals touched down in Belize Saturday, the start of a week-long tour that's already seen a protest. This is our land. Angry local villagers locked in a bitter land dispute with the conservation agency supported by the royal family forced a last-minute change to the couple's planned first stop. Wow, <laughs> Still, it was all smiles for the Duke and Duchess, even as another protest looms when they arrive in Jamaica. There's been a crime against humanity. Rosalie Hamilton was the first to sign an open letter denouncing the visit and calling for reparations. Well, I think the British monarchy and the British family, the, the royal family, have directly benefited from the institutions of slavery and colonization. We've had a lot of chocolate. Oh, oh my goodness. Despite so much pain, the royals have still largely received a warm welcome. The pressure on this younger generation to help keep the monarchy's reach intact. Thank you. It's very nice to see you guys. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, London. Months after they were pushed out of their home by that historic flooding in British Columbia, we had no less than 22 people show up. The moment a couple could finally return home. Our moment is next. This is the home of Kim and Todd Davidson in Princeton, British Columbia. They haven't been able to live there since those massive floods displaced so many people back in November. Now with the help from their community, they have gone back. Their homecoming moment is our moment. We decided we were going to get back in on the 1st of March, which is about 95 days at a motel. We're very, very glad to be back. The water ultimately got up to be about six feet deep in our area, which is about the worst in Princeton. The house apparently was built in 1910, so it's quite old. It's a lovely house and it was extensively damaged. It has been the support of volunteers and our friends and the organizations that get busy in these cases. Well, the very first day when we were able able to get in and, and attempt to clean up, we had no less than 22 people show up. I felt very hopeless and helpless at the beginning. But like Todd said, we couldn't have done it without this town. They really are angels. Despite the flood, I wouldn't want to be any other place. It's that, that sense of community. It's really special. You see all that stuff piled up outside and you can imagine what a huge job it was, but lots of people helped out. The Red Cross, a local Baptist church and others donated money and uh, there they are back in their home near the river and gonna give it another try. That is the National for March 21st. Good night.